Good morning, everyone, to CPA webinar, White Paper Manufacturers Webinars. My name is Fabi, and I work as an events and membership executive for the CPA. This webinar is about a proposed construction product competence standard, and this standard has been developed as part of the work of the competence steering group under the working group 12, construction product competence. It outlines proposals for a standard to unite everyone who uses or works with construction products under a single consistent way of defining construction products competence. It will apply to all the built environment sector. Uh, so this is one of a series of webinars for, a different, for different industries. And this webinar is particularly aimed for manufacturer construction products. Today's figures are Anna Clark, CPA's Digital and Policy Manager and Co-Chair of WG12. She will, begin a present, she will begin giving a presentation about the white paper, which will last around 30 minutes. She will then lead a panel discussion on the paper aims. The participants to the panel discussions are Joe Celia, finishes an exterior sector technical director, deputy chair of the WG12. Douglas Masterson, Guild of Architecture, Architectural Ironmongery, technical manager, co-chair of WG12. Matthew Sexton, BMI Group, director of systems development and compliance. Please feel free to type your queries in the Q&A box and some of them will be answered accordingly during the panel discussion. Before turning the floor over to Anna, I want to remind you all that the webinar will be recorded and the chat will be deactivated. We hope to post the recording on the CPA website within the next 48 hours. Thank you and Anna, you can feel free to begin. Hi everybody, lovely to see so many people joining us today. Let me just bring up the presentation that I'll be giving to all of you now. Um, Fabi, could you do me a favour and confirm that we can see that, please? Yes, we can see the presentation. Wonderful, fantastic. Oh, we've gone too far already. Okay, um, it's wonderful to speak to you all about uh, the white paper that uh, has been developed by uh, the Competence Steering Group, Working Group 12, Construction Products Competence. My name is Hannah Clark. I'm the Digital and Policy Manager at Construction Products Association, and I'm the co-chair of Working Group 12. And um, I'm really looking forward to talk to you about why we have developed this white paper and the contents of what is going to be in the white paper. Now, the white paper is available on the CPA website for anybody who wants to download it. I have put a link at the end of these slides. These slides will be made available to anybody who's attending this webinar, so do not worry about that. Um, and after this presentation, I will be, as Fabi says, leading a panel uh, discussing what uh, this white paper actually means to different parts of the sector, and uh, what the practicalities are going to be of putting some of these things in place. Uh, so, okay, um, and just before I start, I will also mention that Fabi is going to be talking about another webinar we have in the future, which is uh, by one of uh, the charities that CPA really supports, Crash. It's really, really going to be so interesting. So for anybody who wants to sign up to that webinar, listen to Fabi at the end, she's going to give you details. So why do we need this uh, standard? Now, what's the problem that we're dealing with? We're dealing with the fact that every profession and occupation right across the built environment sector uses or otherwise works with construction products. And the misuse of those construction products can have negative impact and performance of systems, potentially dangerous or even fatal 
consequences, as well we know with experiences such as Grenfell Tower fire. And currently, there is no consistent way of recognising who is and who is not competent to use or otherwise work with construction products. So if we have construction products as a linchpin of the built environment, if it's the consistent thread that is going through every part of the supply chain, it stands to reason that we should have a consistent manner of recognising what that competence needs to look like. And I think that's all something that we can agree. But now what we have coming over the horizon at a startling rate is a real business incentive for us to do even more work. And I'm just going to start talking to you about the Building Safety Act. Now, I'm not going to cover this in enormous amounts of detail because that's its own presentation. My God, that's a long one. But there are a few things I want to point out here. It's 171 clauses long. That's in primary legislation only. That does not include all the statutory instruments. It's big. It's one of the biggest acts that we've seen directed at our industry in over 50 years. The other thing I really want to point out, it's not just about buildings in scope. It is about all buildings. It's very much, there's only part four, part four, which is dedicated to buildings in scope. The rest of this act is towards all buildings. And subsequently, what that means is that actually we're talking about the entire built environment because there is no change in a vacuum for our environment. Now, what this act is essentially doing is putting in some big powers. Uh, we're going to have a new regulator for construction products. But the one I'm going to really talk to about today is a building safety regulator that's going to have a real impact on how we deal with competence in our industry. So the building safety regulator has three main functions. It's going to lead the delivery of a new, more stringent regulatory regime for buildings in scope. So what are buildings in scope currently? That is defined as uh, buildings which are occupied over 17, uh, over 18 metres high or seven storeys. But let's be clear about what buildings in scope are. Buildings in scope have been clearly defined to uh, not be specified within the primary legislation. That is so that the scope can be extended whenever necessary. So for this particular uh, regulatory regime, you're going to have more ho hoops to jump through and there's going to be more requirements that are going to cost more money, it's going to spend more time. We do not want to see those appropriately additional uh, requirements being extended out into other parts of um, the sector, the other types of buildings, because that will mean that when we're doing those types of buildings, we will still have to jump through those hoops. So we need to have the same level of checking in the other buildings as the buildings in scope. That's what we need to do to make sure we do not have that scope extended. But even without that scope being extended, the building safety regulator is looking at the competence of everyone working on buildings and it is looking at oversight for the safety and performance of all buildings. So that's really important to understand. Now, I do want to just speak to the building safety regulator where that sits. That sits in the health and safety executive HSC. So we do have some clues as to how the building safety regulator will work. The building safety regulator is not going to be looking over your, um, over your shoulder at every five seconds, but it will um, be on the lookout. And when it smells a problem, it's going to go in and it's going to be able to pull that thread and crawl all over a company like Ants. That's very, very clear to us. That's how they have worked in the past. So that's how we anticipate them working in the future. So they will literally go into a company and find every single thing wrong with it. And then they will, they will prosecute to the fullest extent of the law. So we have to be very clear that this building safety regulator is going to have actions. As part of the building safety regulator, we're also going to be seeing um, the uh, industry competence committee that has already been established in interim form. That is looking at the competence of all of those contributing to the delivery of all buildings. So this is definitely moving in a way where we've got to really pay attention to what our competence looks like because they are specifically looking at these details. We also are seeing some uh, 
statutory instruments being introduced. These have been presented to us in draft at the moment. They've been removed from the DLIP website at the moment, um, but we've been able to see them for long enough to really understand what these are going to entail. Um, and again, these are not specific to one type of building, they're for all buildings, these regulations. So what is in here? We know that duty holders must demonstrate a competent workforce. What does that mean? Who are the uh, duty holders? That is the client, that is uh, the principal designer, the principal contractor, that is designers, that is contractors, and that's the appointed person. So that is saying they need to demonstrate a competent workforce. Who is their workforce? The workforce is their entire supply chain. They must demonstrate a competent workforce. What is competence? Competence is skills, knowledge, experience, and behavior, which is deemed appropriate to carry out the tasks. Now, I have put up clause 12 of the uh, regulations here, and I want to pull your attention to, uh, to Annette, uh, for the purposes of this part, the necessary behaviors include compliance with the relevant requirements, including refusing to carry out any building work which is not in compliance with any relevant requirement. What does this mean? This means that you have a requirement to, if you're uh, doing a task and it falls outside of your competence, you must stop. You must refuse to carry out that work if it is deemed outside of your demonstrable competence. And companies must be able to demonstrate that their uh, workforce is not working outside of their competence. So we need to be able to clearly demonstrate what our competence looks like and clearly demonstrate that people are not working outside of that competence. So the key takeaways I want you to bring into this is that the Building Safety Act is the largest piece of legislation we've had um, applicable to our sector in over 50 years. It's for all buildings and subsequently it's impacting the entire built environment because we do not work in uh, a vacuum. Change has to be done right across the built environment. Penalties now include unlimited fines. So long gone are the days where it's hard to take anyone to task because all you'll get out of them is a few hundred pounds fine. They include unlimited fines and prison time. That's very important. Also, the new regulations are reflecting that of the CDM regs. So we have a lot of opportunity to understand what this is going to look like. We know what the CDM model is, but that includes the definition of the designer. I'm not going to go into that, but what I am going to say is that it extends to designing counts as anything where it's uh, a decision made or a change made about construction products. Uh, any substitution, any decision at all, then you become the designer, you have design responsibility and you have design liability. So that's very important. The moment you change anything to do with construction products, you have design responsibility. There was a duty of competence on the entire supply chain. And this is important. The HSC are working on the basis that the built environment sector can already demonstrate competence we're already doing the work so they think we can already demonstrate competence that's really important to take into consideration when you look at the timeline of when these things are coming into action so you can see here we've had the grenfell tower fire in 2017 2018 is when uh, then Judith Hackett published her reports. Then we had the, uh, the Building Safety Act achieve uh, royal assent in April 2022. We are now in the implementation phase. The implementation phase is from May 2022 to May 2024. That's for us to get ourselves ready, ready and understand exactly how we can demonstrate competence. Very, very important that we understand that we've got a very short time time span to be able to get ourselves up to the mark. Now, I think it's realistic to say, although uh, we have many places within our industry that are competence, 
competence. What we have not been historically good at doing is demonstrating competence and having an infrastructure where people can really understand what competence looks like. And as such, the competence steering group was founded in May 2018. We knew what the Hackett Review was going to say, and we decided that we were going to step up to that mark and really set um, a tone of what standardised competence needed to look like. So uh, that included having these 12 working groups um, put together. And you can see here at the end, Working Group 12, this is the work that we are presenting to you today. Working Group 12 was dealing with construction product competence. And we're unique in the fact that the, uh, the uh, approaches that we are developing has an impact on each and every other part of the built environment sector. The aim of Working Group 12 was to create a solution that ensures that all of those interacting with construction products are competent to do so and that they can demonstrate their competence to others. That is absolutely key. It is the demonstration that is key here. So it's about, are you competent to do the task? Can you demonstrate that competence? Now, as part of the um, CSG work and working with DLUC and uh, working with BSI, uh, we have been creating a set of standards that is starting to point us into the direction of what good looks like. The first one that everyone should be aware of is uh, BSI 8670. That's the core criteria for building safety and competence frameworks. It's a code of practice. It's free to download. So if anybody hasn't seen it yet, please do go onto the BSI website. It's free, it's available, it's accessible. And what that is actually saying is if you have a framework of competence, so what is that? That's training, that's qualifications. It might be if you're a company or an organisation and you are looking at the competence of your people you need to be going into this standard and it's essentially a checklist it's not going to be applicable to everybody but where it is applicable you need to go through those core criteria is it applicable to me is it appropriate to me or the functions I'm developing these frameworks for and if it is you need to tick it off um, and have a method of achieving that competence, demonstrating that competence. So that's what it is. That's a really good basis. And that applies right across the board to anybody who's contributing to uh, the, um, building safety in buildings. And then we have uh, published earlier this year in July, uh, PAV 8671, 8672, 8673. That is looking at the specific uh, individual competences for principal designers, principal contractors, and for individuals or teams working on um, building safety management. So those three com uh, passes are really outlining what are the competences for those individuals, and um, specifically people who are carrying out duties. Um, now, importantly, with all of these, there's two things to really pay attention to in this whole picture. And the first one is that they're all suggesting that if you hold duty, you must be able to demonstrate a competent workforce. You must be able to identify a competent workforce. But what it's not clear about is how. The second thing is that all of these are saying that you must be competent with construction products and building systems and built environment systems, but it's not clear about how. So that's why we, having worked with these standards, we felt it was very necessary that this picture be expanded to talk about what construction product competence actually looks like. And from a perspective of demonstrating a competent workforce, this works very well because we've already identified construction products as a linchpin right throughout the story of, of uh, the built environment sector. So it's a really good space for us to be identifying have we got the right workforce that have the competence for their different levels of responsibilities and accountabilities. So what is in this paper? What is in this paper? This paper is kind of dealing with three kind of big questions. The first one is, 
that we should have a standard. What's the content of the standard? And we have um, defined the content of the standard really pivoting around core level criteria. So in 8670, there were core criteria. This has core criteria as well. It's meant to be made applicable to various different frameworks. Uh, but it's, it's split into levels, levels of responsibility and accountability. So we have a proposal there, and that is to be made applicable for functions and roles right across the industry. As such, um, those requirements won't be specific to every role because we're looking at holistically. What are the things you need to think about? Tick, is that applicable to you? Or if it's not applicable to you, then of course, that's not appropriate to include. But what we do need, because we have these requirements that need to be made applicable, is that we have proposals for a methodology to define how those core level criteria can be applied to the different industries and their organisations consistently. So the first point is, what does the standard look like? The second point, how do we apply it consistently? And then once it's been applied, how do we demonstrate it? How do we utilize it? That's really what this white paper in broad terms is looking at. And we've actually even taken it back to our six core steps. This is the fundamentals of what we're trying to achieve here. So step one, publish the standard, and that's going to take up the majority of what I'm talking about today. Then you've got step two, committing to the principles of CPC. CPC stands for construction product competence. Uh, it's a long thing to say all the time, so we've, we've, I'm sorry, we've given you another acronym, but there it is. So commit to the principles of CPC. Step three, agree how to demonstrate CPC. What did I say? These are applicable principles. They have to be made specific. How do you make them specific to the things you are doing? Step four, demonstrate that we've decided how to make them applicable. Now we need to come up to that level. Step five, utilize these principles. How do we actually use them in practice? Step six, this whole system will need continuous review. So I'm going to go through these steps now, but most of this is going to be focused on step one, because these are the broad principles that we've all got to start understanding, discussing, interrogating, trying to make work for us. So as I've said before, we're aiming to make a, a standard that sits in the 8670 series uh, to work with that, uh, the 8670s, but uniquely in the 8670s, which are are about competence for buildings. This is for anybody in the built environment, anybody working in any part of the built environment who is using or working with construction products. And this is really going to be detailing the five uh, core level criteria. Well, it's I say five core level criteria as though there's only five requirements. There's five levels, each with core criteria within them, okay? Who are they aimed at? They're aimed at anybody designing, marketing, or selling construction products, anybody providing technical support for construction products, anybody specifying construction products or designing with construction products, procuring construction products, handling or installing construction products, supervising, inspecting, or verifying other functions around construction products, exchanging information about construction products, owning, maintaining, or decommissioning construction products. This is not an exhaustive list. This is just to give a really good view of the extent to this, where this uh, is meant to be covering. It's meant to be covering anybody who is working with construction products in any way, making decisions about construction products. I'm gonna be speaking about functions and not roles. Who's these competences appropriate for? It's for functions, it's not for roles. What is the difference? A role is a title and we do not have standardized titles in the constructions and built environment sector, but we can define functions. So for example, we have here a manufacturer, an engineer, a contractor, each one of them can be doing the function of specifying. We can talk about the function of specifying, but we cannot talk about what particularly somebody who has got a role in manufacturing, engineering or track contracting is particularly doing. So these competences will be applied to the functions, not the roles. The in words, if you were. 
What are the core level criteria? As I said before, there are a set of applicable principles with the aim that these be mapped against existing or new training and qualifications or other methods of demonstration. They're here to give clear levels of product competence applicable right across the sector. And what we're looking for is a language that we can communicate, that somebody on one end of the sector can speak to somebody in quite another one and interrogate those levels of competence. What level of competence do you have? Oh, we have this one. We have level B, we have level C. You know, we, we can communicate on these terms. And then we are making sure that people have the appropriate competence to carry out a certain function pertaining to products and clear when the actor does not have that appropriate competence. That's very important. And this is really uh, starting to broaden out what these different levels are. Now, they don't have clear titles. What we have got here is flags in the sand, essentially. Individuals are competent to be, and these are example capabilities, but they're here to try and see you to understand where individuals should be sitting in these different levels. At level E, the lowest level, but still competent, not level U, which is ungraded, you still have to have a level of competence at level E. You would anticipate this would be somebody who's responsible for performing tasks with and about construction products under supervision or responsible for relaying information about construction products without interpretation. That's very key. So here is an example. We have person A walks into a shop and says, I would like some Marmite. Person B is level E competent. They can say, that is Marmite. That is what they're doing. They're able to identify the Marmite. Person A might say, what are the ingredients of Marmite? Person B can say, I can read you the ingredients from the Marmite bottle that has the authoritative uh, information about the ingredients of Marmite. They can uh, relay information without interpretation from authoritative sources. That's level E. Level D, we've got a step up in that picture. picture. So your level D person in a shop, somebody's walking on, person A walks into a shop, they say, I would like a yeast spread for my fantastic sandwich. Level D says, we have these yeast spreads. We have Marmite and we have Vegemite. And uh, if, if person A says, oh, which is the better of those yeast spreads for my fantastic sandwich? These uh, person B, which is a level D level of competence says, I cannot tell you because I do not have the appropriate level of competence. I can point you to the range of different uh, products. So you can propose the construction products uh, meeting the uh, scope of application, but cannot select them, cannot, cannot tell you which ones to take, okay? Level C is where choice starts to come into it, but it's a limited choice. We're starting to talk about construction products within a direct scope of application. You can be responsible for developing product information for construction products within a direct scope of application. You can be responsible for relating product information within an extended scope of application. In broad terms, a direct scope of application, we're saying this is what the manufacturer says you can do with the construction product. An extended scope of application is uh, you can make choices with that construction product outside what the manufacturer said is intended, assuming you go through the appropriate um, uh, tests or calculations through approved methods. So level C, you cannot make choices when it comes to extended scopes of, of application, but you can carry out uh, the instructions about it. Whereas B, that's the point when you're you're pretty much up there at level B, you can do everything. You can you can uh, talk about developing product information within extended scopes of application. You can understand what are all, all of the requirements that you need to go through to do all of that work. You know what tests need to be carried out. You know what approved calculations are necessary. You can make it available for its project specific application. You are accountable for the accuracy of product information within direct scopes of application as well. And then level A is the final checker. 
accountable for construction product decisions, assessment, selection, change, recommendations and approval, uh, approvals, Appro accountable for product information and its accuracy, accountable for the organization's construction product rules. This is the person who we anticipate is going to be uh, very far and few between, particularly in companies, we wouldn't expect to see like a whole wave of A's. But what we would expect is that the person that is accountable for these decisions that were construction products, they sit at level A in most cases. For whenever it comes to uh, important decisions or organization decisions or how you're interpreting standards in a forward fa uh, forward facing perspective, that's a level A person doing it. So we've got here a real uh, change of how we're splitting up the responsibilities and accountabilities. And each one of these different levels have similar activities that they will still need to be dealing with, similar themes, and but they will be at different levels within each of those. And those themes are, we've got here nine of them, there's responsibility and accountability. That is the most important one for us to consider. We need to know the limitations, what we can do, what we cannot do within our level. We have uh, construction product performance and characteristics, regulation standards and certification, products as part of a built environment system, including substitution or value engineering. We have to talk about value engineering in this picture. People still do it. We need to make sure if you're going to do value engineering, you do actual real value engineering competently. That's key. Uh, installation information, durability, service life and maintenance, warranties and guarantees, storage and handling, competence maintenance. Now, here's the thing. I have said it before, I'll say it again. It doesn't mean that you will need to do every for the functions that you're looking at the competence for. It is likely not every single requirement is appropriate to you. There may be plenty of roles out there that have absolutely nothing. And when I say roles, I mean functions. Plenty of functions out there that have absolutely nothing to do with, say, warranties and guarantees. But you need to be able to go through, check holistically, is there something where they should have that knowledge to be able to have a, make appropriate decisions on it? You need to be able to go through, check, does that apply? Does it? Yes, then there should be a competence there. Does it not apply? Fine, move on to the next one. That's how we need to think of these. So, you have the details of what those requirements look in the white paper, do look it up. But the next thing is once we've got the standard and we've got them published, what we need everybody do, to do. In fact, anybody can do this right now, but we really need industries and organisations to commit to the CPC principles. So what that, does that mean? We need to recognise that we have to have people competent with construction products to do their tasks appropriately. We need to recognize that and we need to be able to establish the basic rules so that we can uh, control the application of CPC. So that includes putting in processes, who is making those um, decisions, who is signing things off, who is passing on information. We need to have people ready to establish those rules to commit to the CPC principles. Step three is about methods of um, demonstration. So what does that mean? So you need to take those, um, those requirements and, in, and you need to identify the functions within your industries or organizations. So as I say, industries or organizations, this could be done by singular companies. They can look at the standards, they can identify their functions, they can go, okay, this is, uh, we're checking this off these people with these functions will demonstrate it this way and um, you can do that work as an individual company or we can have industries coming together through consensus and making decisions about how we demonstrate um, uh, CPC uh, um, from a holistic point of view. Why is that important? That's particularly important to bring um, uh, both so that we can publish what what's good looks like 
So the supply chain can have a look at it. But also we've got plenty of SMEs that need to be given really clear direction as to how to achieve it. And they may well not have the resource to go through the standards and identify these things on their own. So it can be done through consensus. It can be done from organisations. There are pros and cons to both of these perspectives. But what we're looking for is to create what we call CPC profiles. A CPC profile identifies the function. What are those applicable CPC requirements? Are there any specific requirements that you need to add? And then what does demonstration actually look like? So you can map that. And then there may be some gap analysis that has to follow that. Um, where there's potentially uh, the existing training and qualifications maybe doesn't meet all the mark and they need to be improved, or maybe there's holes where new training and qualifications need to be uh, brought into the space. So um, just really quickly, and I'm sorry that this is so small, but you can see it in the actual white paper. We have two examples of CPC profiles. Um, and this one is for warehouse, warehouse operating um, for uh, guild uh, for iron iron um, architectural iron mongery. Nobody can say these words. Um, for that function, you can see here that we've got the methods of demonstration. So you need a, a, a combination. We've got training from a company on in-house operating systems. We've got trade counter experience. We need a foundation in hardware. Uh, we have um, a CPD, which has been put in there as well. So there is a combination of methods of demonstrating the requirements. And underneath it, you also have listed what are the identified different requirements, um, which I clearly can't fit on this slide. And then just to uh, be able to show you what that can be compared to for somebody who's specifying architectural iron mongery, you clearly have far greater requirements uh, as a method demonstration. And in this particular scenario, there are clearly some which are mandatory uh, as far as the GAI are concerned, and there are others which are considered as optional. Uh, but it's painting a picture of what this holistic demonstration of competence look like. So do check those out in the white paper. And I'm sure Douglas can uh, say something about that a bit later. And then finally, we've got um, the methods of demonstration. Uh, so once you've got this all laid out, you know how your functions are demonstrating competence, then it's for individuals to achieve that level of competence. It's for organisations to ensure that their individuals are achieving that competence, that they clear what their competence looks like, that they are not working outside of those levels of competence. Verifications can be done by the organisations themselves, but you must be uh, able to evidence it to others. That's the clarity there. It can be interrogated by others. How are you backing it up? And we're from the manufacturing industry. We should be able to say if it's going to perform that way, this is the evidence of how it's doing it. We should be well used to this concept. And then we should be able to communicate that to others. Uh, we can clearly communicate uh, that demonstration right through the supply chain. So the utilisation can come in lots of different forms. We can have clients and employers uh, requiring it uh, contractually. We can have duty holders using it to demonstrate their competent workforce. We can have contractors, be that designers, constructors, maintainers, or others can use it to qualify the competence of their supply chain. Think maybe, for example, like PQQs, but technical. Uh, we can have manufacturers using it to demonstrate their competence for, for a CCPI accreditation. Also, interestingly, you could say that to honor the terms of a warranty and guarantee or guarantee, you must demonstrate competence. And that would be a really interesting lever that manufacturers could have available to them. Insurers may use CPC to appropriately assess the risk of an organization and regulators can use it to assess the competence of a workforce has been verified. And then finally, this whole thing will need to undergo reviews. That's periodic review of CPC core level criteria standard, the standard that still will need to go through review. 
um, it will need to be reviewed, how you'll demonstrate it would need to go under review, and you'll need periodic review of the individuals actually achieving competence. Competence is not a static thing. You do not get it once and then you're competent forever. It's a never ending circle of competence. And we're well used to within this industry, used to recognizing that as well. So this should not be a shock. So what do we need from you? from everybody who's been kind enough to attend this um, presentation today. We want you to all recognize the importance of construction product competence and understand how necessary it's going to be for us to come up to these new uh, regulations and how it should be the way that we're working. We should not be making decisions about construction products unless we are competent to do so. Uh, please do read the white paper, share it, discuss it. It's it's there for your consumption. It's there for everybody to be able to try and work out how to use it. We want you to trial it. We want you to test it. Uh, we're not having a public consultation for it, but we are looking to engage. What is working? What is not? Let's have this conversation because eventually we want this to go for a standard process where there is a big public consultation with the proper resources to administrate that. And we want everybody to be in a situation that when it comes to that public consultation, you've had enough time to test this and enough time to make sure it works and uh, make sure it's practical and understand what potentially might be missing as well for us to be able to um, appropriately get some good solid feedback for, for the standard. So I think that's about it for me. I feel like I've gone over my time. It probably I've definitely gone over my time. I'm very sorry. Uh, but uh, now it's it's a good time for me to um, bring on the panel. Now, how do I stop sharing this now? Oh, I'm at stop share. There we go. Ah, fantastic. And uh, great. We have some excellent people joining us. So I think what I'm going to do, if it's OK, if I could go uh, to each one of you in turn, if you could just give everybody a quick introduction about yourself, and if you could also say what this CPC standard will mean to your industry and your parts, your potentially your organisation. Um, who should we go to first? Uh, Douglas. Yes, thank you, Hannah, and good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm Douglas Masters, and I'm the technical manager of the Guild of Architectural Ironmongers. See, it's not that hard to say, Hannah. Um, <laughs> and uh, I have, uh, I'm have i co-chair of Working Group 12 and have been in Working Group 12 really since its inception. Uh, I'm also involved in the Confidence Steering Group, so have been involved in this process for, for quite quite some time now. Um, in, in answer to your question, what will the CPC standard mean for, for our industry, well, for the architectural ironmongery industry, uh, a lot. Um, and the reason for that is like many industries uh, in construction products, you have a mixture of people who have qualifications and a mixture of people who are just used to doing their role because they've done it in a certain way for so many years. Um, the whole thing about uh, what we're looking to do is not just to say that we're competent, it's to demonstrate that competence. So having a model that is there for people to be able to, to, to clearly and visibly demonstrate their competence and put an onus on them to do so, I think is of huge importance. We already have our own training uh, mechanisms within our industry, uh, and that is something that has been used for, uh, frequently and is used very, very often within ours. But it does, as I say, put the onus on people being able to demonstrate that and that their knowledge is up to date, even if that's through a CPD system, such as the one that we would have. Mm. Thank you very much, Douglas. Um, Joe, would you like to come in? Same question and uh, tell everybody who you are. Really good, Hannah. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Joe Celia. I'm the technical director of uh, a trade body called FIS. We represent the finishes and interior sector. So it's a very wide base of construction products that are used in, in our sector. Um, I've been involved with this with Hannah and uh, with uh, Douglas and a whole team of people. Uh, my role has been the deputy chair um, uh, over this period. So big team of people pulling this together sort of so far. What will it mean for our industry? Very much, I suppose, like um, Douglas has said, actually, we've got, a, we've got a framework. I think up until now, you start to look at people's competence and they're very much based on, have you got an MVQ? Show me your competence, show me that bit of paper. 
at least now we understand the difference between skills, knowledge, experience and behaviours and actually how all four of those are required to, to be able to demonstrate that level of competence. I think the big biggest area for our sector is when you've got not just the specialists perhaps putting a ceiling up or putting a drywall up, but actually where you've got fit out contractors doing all of that. And to have a level of competence to understand actually what the performance of that wall is and where the weaknesses are. And if we take something like a firewall where you've got perforations going through its services, how do you link up the performance of the service penetration and the passive fire protection to that is so important. So we, we definitely welcome this. We think it will make a huge difference uh, to our sector. And we know that our members are, are really interested in what we're doing. Thank you very much, Joe. And Matt Sexton, same to you, please. Hi, Hannah. Hi, everybody. I'm Matthew Sexton. I'm the UK Director of Systems Development and Compliance for a company called BMI. We are a, a part of a group that are the world's largest manufacturer of roofing materials um, based all across the world from, from the US to, to Malaysia, but with a, a big focus and, and, a, and a big lead in the UK. Um, I've been involved, involved in WG12 for, for, for some time, um, including CCPI and the white paper. Um, and what does it mean for, for our industry? I think very similar to Douglas and Joe, it's about setting a framework and it's about bringing this to people's day-to-day -day reality of what they need to do. Competence is, um, should we say, no longer a nice to have, it's an essential, it's a mandatory thing. That's what this is all about for me. And it's also about people understanding and realizing that it's um th this is not just because you're a director or you've got a very senior sounding title in the business does not necessarily mean you can demonstrate competence mm. um and you, you know I, i've sat with groups of directors and talked to them about this and their, their instant reaction is well I'm a director. I'm I, I'm 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 going to be A. You you you've explained to me E to A. I'm A. Mm. And I and I've had to say to a few of them, "You're the sales director. Do you think you're technically competent?" Mm. Oh, but that's that, that's your role. Y yes, exactly. So so you will have a level of competence E to A, but just because you're a director doesn't mean you're A. And, and it came as a little bit of a shock to some of them that because they're a director does not mean they're going to automatically get a sort of a, a free ticket to a level A. They're mm. going to have to demonstrate this. They're going to have to attend training courses. They're going to have to sit exams and they're going to have to demonstrate their competence. And, and I think what's interesting here is, is is they may not need to demonstrate a to be competent in what they're doing, but they do need to make sure that the sign off process is so that the, the um, sign off goes to the appropriate person who can. I think this is really interesting. So um, Douglas went through and was um, doing the first drafts of these CPC profiles that I put up on the screen. And, and you, you found something quite similar, wasn't it, Douglas? If I could just pass that over to you for a sec. Yes, uh, uh, we we took a look at, um, at making profiles of, uh, of of two two functions, uh, not rules, as Hannah had said earlier. It's, it's uh, that that was one of the blind alleys we went down initially in, in WG twelve. Uh, that one uh, one rule can have many functions. So if you take, for example, in the in the ironmongery sector, you may have an estimator who prices bills of quantities, who specifies architectural ironmongery, who might even help out in the trade counter. Uh, particularly on, on some of the smaller businesses. So they, they sort of multi-functions. And the whole thing that we found was you needed to take a look at the competency of, of the function. Uh, and, and I had it in my head that uh, people who were specifying architectural ironmongery should be level A. And, and that, was, that was my perception, a bit like Matt had said, that someone who's a director should be level A. Uh, and when I took a look at the, uh, at, at the competence levels, uh, that were on the, on the, the chart, 
it actually became, um, I suppose it became evident to me that it's not level A, it's actually level B. And that's fine. It doesn't mean that you're incompetent. It doesn't mean you have to be level A for everything. Uh, level B for an architectural ironmongery scheduler is really where somebody should be. Level A would be someone up above that who would be signing off on um, third party certification, who would be uh, putting together the declarations of performance. That's not somebody who's uh, specifying ironmongery for a building. So I, I found that quite a challenge whenever we looked at that. And and likewise, you know, we talked about um, the, the warehouse function, someone who's in a warehouse. Level E is fine for that. That's not to say that um, he, he needs to be level D and move his way up to level C and B. When you take a look at level E for the, the requirements of that role, someone who is uh, who's taking uh, orders from a picking ticket and, and assembling them to go out uh, onto a construction site, level E will be fine for that. They're not making decisions. If they're making decisions, they're then going to need to be in level above that you know, up to level D and then beyond up into level C. So I suppose it really is just a matter of taking a look at the function and being honest when you're doing it and not what you would like it to be, but what it actually is. Mm, that's a really interesting point. I, I can see, Matt, you want to come back on that. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great explanation, Douglas, because to, to me, somebody can do the same role at all levels. So you could specify at level E, Mm -hmm. But their specification would be no interpretation, simply following what is in the literature, what, it, you know, just taking it out and effectively saying there is what you need. But it could go all the way, as you say, up to level B, where there's a lot more detailed interpretation. But it's, it's, it's for people to, to realise and understand they've got to work out how they do their role and how their company allows them to do their role and how their company functions, that there will be different people potentially even doing the same role, but at different levels. And that's not a problem. It's not a, a challenge to their quality. It's just they are maybe doing simplistic specification, if I'm going to call it that. Or like you say, Douglas, just simply picking parts off a shelf. They're doing a, a task, they're doing a great service as part of doing that job, but they don't need to be level A to do that. They need to be level E. And again, that they might be doing other parts, non-technical parts of their role at level A. Um, you know, a, a sales director, you know, in terms of their skill of working out margins and all those types of things, that's not a technical competence. But they would need, if there was a technical competence for sales directors, that would be covered there, if you see what I mean. Mm -hmm. But for, for technical issues, they probably only need to be at the, you know, potentially at E or D. But they could, if they're really experienced and they've done all the training, they could be a level B or, or, or A. It's how your business functions. It's how mm. your your people are structured and what training they go through and what competence and skills they have. Mm. So I'm hoping that these different levels will be really clear to, to allow people to identify uh, where these functions actually sit and then what is the necessarily competence attached to, to that. Um, Joe, you have your hand up, please. Yeah, I did. I've, I've been looking at uh, some of the questions which have been uh, mm. useful you. as well, and I want to try and address some of those in, 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 in a particular way, and at the same time talk about the role of the trade associations. Mm. Douglas and I, well, all three of us, all four of us actually, are members of, of a trade association, so we're there to serve our members, that we're there to inform uh, our members as well. So the, the, moving this forward, one of the things that, that, that I think we will all be doing is looking at our particular sector to develop um, a, a framework that can be used within the sector. So it might be used, it might be about the use of dry lining or ceilings or fire protection or passive fire protection or anything else. And, you know, there are other trade associations like ASFP who are the specialists in those sector and, and trade associations do talk with each other. We, we work together, we coordinate things as well. And what that will do, it will allow us to engage. So there is a, there's a question in the, in the, in the chat from 
uh, somebody asking about how do we get to know this information? We, we get to know the information by doing things like this. Social media is very good. Our websites are, are really good about spreading the word. Um, so that if you're not already involved with the trade association, it's worth looking at where there are similarities there and, and engage with that as well. I think the biggest thing for me with this is this move away from jobs descriptions. So looking at a specifier or a supervisor, it's about what are they specifying? Are they specifying? Which products are they specifying? And where is their knowledge base and their competence within that? And how, uh, there's, a, there's a question as well, I think from Devi about machine readable and about how, how is this information actually gonna be got out? So there are card systems. There is a process using uh, My Professional Passport where all of this information can be stored freely by the people who, you know, the, the people on the ground, as it were, the people who, who are looking at their own level of competence. They take it with them as they move jobs and then on demand, uh, people can get that information. So it's a beginning to having machine readable information that, that can be uh, made accessible. Um, and the other thing as well is I think with all of this work, this is not trying to reinvent or change what's already there. So if there are qualification systems, and remember that that knowledge is, is demonstrated broadly with qualifications, then that knowledge using MVQs, using apprenticeships will sit as part of this structure. There's, there's no point in looking to change any of that and make it. So I think the key thing on this is we, we've, got, we've got a way to go. This is the first big step. It's taken four years to get where we are. Uh, so this is sharing this information with you, using the steps as Hannah has um, discussed, but then going back to the trade associations who represent your sector and ask them, what are you doing and how can we work together to, to do that? I think it's key in moving this forward. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, uh, just for everybody's reference, I'm afraid because I ran over, we're extending this webinar for another 10 minutes. So I'm hoping that you'll still be able to stay with us until then. Um, I have some questions in the chat and I really appreciate, Joe, um, that you have uh, brought that uh, up because um, uh, we do intend to answer some of these. We're not going to be able to get through to all of them. And also, some of them are really long, so they're hard for me to keep track of them. But anyway, I did want to bring up one uh, we've got from Debbie Carlton, demonstrating a competent workforce and ensuring competent workers are allocated to the right work requires organizational and supply chain competence management, but very few organizations have these kinds of platforms or systems. How do you see this barrier being addressed? Um, Matt, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I, I do, and I, I've been through this before. Um, I, over many years, I run some pretty complex technical projects and um, to me, the thing to do when, when you assemble a project team is one of the first things you should do is do an analysis of the project and analyse what skills and competences you need from the team to do the project successfully. And, and effectively, you then um, review that project versus participants and understand whether you've got any gaps. And, and this is going to be no different in terms of, uh, as Joe's been saying, we, we've got to register and record your competence in a form, whether that's a passport, whatever it is, but then people should then be allocated only to tasks that fall within that competence. Because I see many times over my many years, and I think it's even been the occasion when Joe and I have been together somewhere, where we witnessed somebody trying to do a task and when we said to them, whoa, 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 hold on a second, maybe you're not doing it quite right, their response was, well, I've never done it before. And you think, well, why did their, their supervisor allocate them the task when they've never done the task before, if that makes sense? And, you know, this is going to be a fundamental change to how people are going to have to function and, and, and think about things. But at the end of the day, also, this is for individuals because an individual's got to say, I can't do that task that I've been allocated. We all have a personal individual responsibility for the safety of ourselves and for the safety of the building and for the, for the safe use of the construction products that we're working on. And the first thing you've got to do is 
what I call become um, know that you are consciously incompetent, if that makes sense. Yeah. So to know that you can't do that task, to know that you can't offer advice in that area, because unless you can mentally think that through, you will find, and I've seen it many, many times, people doing tasks, offering opinions, offering specifications that they don't have the skills and competence to do. And, and you can people can say it's the system, but to me, it is there's also an individual element for this. Yeah. And it's no different to safety. I always remember years ago, a well-known main contractor called Weights Construction ran a huge big safety campaign, and it was a really simple safety campaign. They put giant mirrors next to the site entrance doors and turnstiles. And there was a very simple message across the top. Who's going to look after your safety today? Mm, yeah. And it's that simple in my mind. It's that simple that people have got to, to understand that they know their own limitations. But also, I think, um, and, and that is 100% appropriate, it is an individual responsibility, but it's also an organisational responsibility. But we know, and, and I can see um, that there are some comments in here, which is like, we'll probably need enormous systems to be able to, to do this work of demonstration. Um, we haven't uh, pulled some of these concepts out of the air. Um, we've come across companies that are already doing very similar work and demonstrating it, and they're not using complex approaches. Um, Joe, maybe you could speak to that a bit. I was wondering whether you're going to you're going to raise that. <laughs> <laughs> so the the example is a is a large manufacturer who's looked at their technical teams, and the technical teams can be anybody who's picking up the phone. Um, or providing advice, so in in-house uh, technical as well as their external technical teams as well. And they started to look at uh, levels of competency in the same way, five levels of competence, um, and, and mapped out, as, as, as Matt said, actually mapping out what was required to do that function. Mm -hmm. And then looked at the people, evaluated the people that were currently doing the functions together with the people to do two things. One, work out where they sat, but also, also actually to be able to help them develop themselves to understand what they needed to do to, to, to move on to, to, the, to the next uh, function. Um, I want to pick up on a, a, one, of the convers one of the questions in there as well. And it, again, it's, it's from somebody saying, oh, so you've taken four years to do this and we've got 18 months to do it. And I sort of, I can see a, hmm, thanks in there. <laughs> Where, where's that? <laughs> It's a valid question because there is a lot to do. We knew, we knew from Dame Judith's first uh, report that actually competence, she says it, there's a lack of competence in the market. So we knew this was always coming. But I think don't be frightened. Uh, I think you said this at the beginning, Hannah, that uh, we're already installing products. We're already using construction products. Um, this shouldn't be too difficult to move to an area where we can demonstrate our competence. So I think if we start to look at uh, the people within our control, the people that we're working with, look at those functions, look at the level of competence that's required to carry out that function, and then map the information that you've got. And if it requires some more training, if it requires more uh, experience, if it requires more skills to be developed, then you've got time to move that in, but don't wait until 2024. Start the process now. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Joe. Um, and, and the reality of it is, yes, four years. It has been quite a long time we've been developing this. Why? It's extremely complex to make something. And this is as simple as we can make it. That's very challenging for us to do that something that is consistent right across the picture. And unfortunately, that's just the cards that we've been dealt. Um, and I see here, we've got here uh, from Jonathan Ducker, one of the key issues is knowing when you aren't competent to answer a question or make a decision and knowing to push the question to someone who is competent, knowing your limits, making sure people are appropriately trained. Um, Douglas, I wondered if you could answer a question for me on that kind of 
uh, line. What does this mean for potentially, for example, who will be authorizing things? What would that mean for our supply chain, do you think? Yeah, I think we've summed it up fairly well previously. It's 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 knowing when to say no. Uh, because part of the issues are that um, when people ask get asked questions, they, they feel under pressure that they should know the answer even when they don't. Mm. And then there is that temptation to almost guess. Mm -hmm. And without realizing that in guessing the implications of that guess, because we all know in the construction product sector that we, we don't live in isolation from each other. I, I, I work in the architectural ironmongery sector, but you need to screw architectural ironmongery onto doors. Yeah. You need to fit doors into, 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 into big, great big holes in walls. There needs to be gaps. There needs to be the, the wall structure. And it's, it, it's the whole thing that people need to ensure that whenever they are put on the spot, whenever they're asked the question, it's to know the, the limit, to know the levels of their competency. And I think the other thing with that as well is that from uh, from an organizational perspective, if there is a competence matrix in place, that can actually help with gap analysis and training. Yeah. So that whenever you're taking a look and, and you're, you're, you're sitting down with your employee at, at your annual review uh, and, and for someone who uh, you, who has the the maybe the, the, the correct uh, attitude and, and who wants mm -hmm. to move forward. How how do I get then from from level level A to, or sorry from level E to level D? So how how can I move along in that? Let's let's take a look at that, and that's something that can be sat down. For example, with your your manager it could be with a training manager, it could be within the HR department. But I think in terms of from an organisational perspective, this will help because mm -hmm. whenever you're sitting there with um someone and and you've taken a look at what this particular um, function should be in terms of what level it should be at, and you can determine what what level this particular person is at, then that mm -hmm. can certainly help within the organisational perspective. Thank you very much. Matt, you've got your hand up in response. Yeah, to I, I, I totally agree with Douglas there, and I can give a practical example of this. A few years back, I took over responsibility for a global technical team, um, and I needed to... You know, I spent some time with them, saw them operate in the field, saw them um, operate on, on the technical advice lines, saw that. But I wanted to have a way to actually compare, if that makes sense, and understand their competence in, in a measurable way. So I set them all on exam. I just took basic, so, some questions that I'd heard some of them be asked when I'd been with them and put them into an exam paper and said, right, everybody's going to sit the exam and, and you're going to, and I wrote uh, what I would call a, uh, an example answer, if that makes sense. And I got them to, 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 to write out that their answers. And then I went for and I marked them. And there was one guy who really stood out. When he answered a question, the answers were absolutely spot on. Mm. Absolutely spot on perfectly accurate and correct but he didn't answer many questions so when i sat down with him after the exam and going through it showing him his scores and i had given him a given everybody a score against all the answers if that makes sense or all the questions and then against the ones they'd answered and his score against uh, over the, all the questions wasn't brilliant but his score when you looked at it against what he had answered was in the high 85, 90% bracket. And I said to him, um, that's brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant, Dexter. I said, um, can, can you explain to me though, was, was it was language an issue? You know, he was in the Philippines. He, he lived on a fairly remote Filipino island. And I thought, what, what is it? And he said, oh, no, 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 I understood all the questions, but I didn't know the answers to some of them. So I just didn't answer them because I didn't want to guess. Now, when I looked at some of the other exam papers, it was really clear the people who were guessing, oh, who had right. answered every question, every question, but there was some way you think you, you didn't, you didn't understand the question or you didn't know the answer and you've just guessed at an answer. But okay, he, well, that's he knew really that the best great tactic now. was don't answer it if I don't know the answer. It's fantastic. That's really interesting. Um, 
but uh, we have two minutes left and then I need to pass it over to Fabi. But I want to just pose one really quick question to all three of you. Um, you've got like 30 seconds to come back a bit. And I, I guess what, it, what I want to know is what would you say to people who think this is going to be too much of a challenge? Right. Uh, just quickly for everybody, I am going to be looking at over some of these questions we haven't been able to get to. If it's possible, we might put out a QA, and a um, but we will be looking at them. But my question is to all of you, um, what would you think, say to people who think this is going to be too much work, too much of a challenge, too, too hard for our industries to talk to each other? Um, what would you say to that, Joe? It is going to be hard. It is going to be hard. We, we, we mustn't underestimate that this is a challenge. Um, but it's a challenge that is achievable and it's a challenge that must be achievable. On the wall behind me, I've got a copy of the Evening Standard and there's a picture of the tower burning. And, and, and under that, it actually says, let this be a lesson. Sorry, guys. Let this be a lesson. Now, let's be a symbol of the time we learned a new and better way. Let's just hang on to that. Mm. Let's just hang on to why we're doing this. We have to learn the lessons. It won't be easy, mm. but it is achievable. Sorry for the disruption. That's OK. Thank you. Uh, Douglas, you've got 20 seconds. <laughs> wow. For me, that's difficult. Uh, for people say, what, uh, what, what could this cost me to do it? Mm. I, would answer the I would answer that with, well, what could it cost you if you don't? Yeah. It's it's just that simple. We're we're now in we're in a different landscape now. A, a heavily regulated one is coming over the hill, which we've already talked about, and we really really need to look at getting our house in order. Mm. Thank you, Douglas and Matt. To you as well. This is about people's lives, mm. and therefore I don't think there's anybody who should be saying, "I can't. I haven't got the time." You know, I, you know, it's going to take too much, mm. and, and that's, you know, that is, I'm afraid, the the real, unfortunate, and simple reality of this. Mm. Yeah, that's excellent. Well, I, I really appreciate everybody who's come to speak today. Um, thank you so much for your time and everybody who's listened. And now I just want to hand over to Fabi uh, to uh, close out this webinar. Fabi, over to you. Thanks, Anna. And thank you, everyone, for joining this webinar today. We hope you find, found it insightful. If you have any further questions or comments, please do not hesitate to contact us. Um, lastly, I would like to remind you all that we are going to have a short webinar uh, with our chosen charity, Crush, on Wednesday, the 12th of October at 11 a.m. Uh, to hear how they help all homeless charities and hospice by channeling professional expertise, products and donations from across the construction industry. Um, please don't forget to register on the CPA homepage and Thank you, everyone, and have a nice rest of the day. Thank you ever so much, everyone. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Thanks.